We're starting. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone, uh, or good morning if you are uh, in North America. Um, my name is Yulia Skubitska, and I'm project director at War Childhood Museum in U Ukraine. And today I will be mo moderating a roundtable uh, titled Babin Yar, Memory Today, Puzzles and Troubles. Um, yesterday was the official commemoration day for the Babin Yar massacre that happened, uh, that took place in Kiev 79 years ago. Uh, we know, uh, I, first I will uh, provide a brief background for those of you who have not been following the events with um, uh, the latest efforts uh, of uh, Babin Yar tragedy decommemoration. And then I will uh, present uh, the roundtable participants. Uh, and hopefully after their presentations, we are going to have a, a fruitful discussion on the matter. So um, as of now, uh, commemoration of uh, the Babin Yar tragedy has, uh, uh, is a work in progress. Uh, unfortunately, so far, uh, the Ukrainian state has not yet produced a comprehensive project. And it's, it's a, also in the making, so we'll see how uh, that evolves. But uh, as of now, the most uh, prominent, uh, probably the most visible uh, uh, commemoration effort is uh, the uh, Babin Yar uh, uh, Holocaust Memorial Center, which is a private initiative uh, sponsored uh, mainly by uh, Russian oligarchs. Uh, I guess the most prominent of them is uh, Mikhail Friedman. Um, the project has been quite controversial for, for uh, some time, first of all, because of uh, the uh, donors' connections to Russia, to, to even Kremlin. Uh, yet, um, the, it, be, it entered public debate uh, in uh, uh, starting from uh, November 2019 with the change in the leadership when uh, a Russian film director, uh, Ilya Khajanovsky, was appointed uh, as the uh, artistic director of the center. Uh, Ilya Khajanovsky has, before that appointment, he, he had not worked in, uh, in museums. He had not done any commemoration project. He is most famous for a rather controversial project called Dao that has been filmed in Kharkiv. Um, uh, Dao, among other uh, things, uh, for example, engaged Russian neo-Nazis on the set, uh, which uh, made uh, the public question uh, how the aptitude of uh, the new uh, leader, of uh, course. Yet it was not just Khrushchevsky's background that Ukrainian international experts and public found disturbing, but also the preliminary concept of the memorial that appeared in media in April 2020. Um, I, we don't have time to discuss it in detail yet. Uh, I would just mention that uh, the uh, um, project historical consultant, uh, Karl Berghoff resigned after uh, he uh, saw it. Uh, and uh, his comment was that the project was, uh, had the potential of turning uh, the, um, this, uh, the Memorial Center into a Holocaust Disneyland, I'm quoting him here. Uh, the project, like the project, has stirred a uh, pretty intense public debate uh, among Ukrainian uh, intellectuals, among international experts. Several letters, uh, several public uh, petitions have been signed. Uh, yet, uh, so far, like as of now, uh, the uh, memorial center enjoys state support from Ukraine and from the city of Kyiv. We uh, just had commemoration events uh, yesterday uh, where the memorandum of cooperation was signed between uh, Ukrainian Ministry of Culture and uh, the Memorial Center. Uh, that installation, I don't know if our participants followed it, uh, has also stirred some controversy uh, among people who uh, care about the topic. Uh, Facebook reaction was, I would say, rather emotional regarding that. Um, so uh, it has been, uh, the commemoration efforts of Bob and Yar have been at the center of very intense debates uh, for the past half a year at least. And uh, I hope that uh, today we will uh, 
hear more uh, about uh, that, about the way we should be approaching uh, this topic. And I am very happy to present you our uh, speakers today. Um, these are Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet, uh, Professor Emerita and Professor Emerita of Performance Studies at New York University, uh, Chief Curator at the Core Exhibition at Poland Museum of the History of Polish Jews. Her books include Destination Culture, Tourism, Museums and Heritage, Image Before My Eyes, A Photographic History of Jewish Life in Poland, 1864-1939, They Called Me Mayor, July, uh, Painted Memories of a Jewish Childhood in Poland Before the Holocaust. Uh, our second presenter is uh, Dieter Pohl, uh, Professor of Contemporary History with a special emphasis on Eastern and Southeastern Europe at the University of Klagenfurt. Um, his research interests include the history of the Soviet Union, the National Socialist Occupation Regime, and uh, the Second World War in Europe and Asia. Uh, just the latest of his books, unfortunately, I will be reading them in English, but uh, my, my German, unfortunately, is <laughs> almost absent. So, uh, 2020, Holocaust is an Open Secret. Uh, also, 2020 collective publication, The Organization of Terror, The Service Calendar of Heinrich Himmler, 1943-1945, Forced Labor in Hitler's Europe, Occupation Labor Consequences. And our third participant is Jana Barinova. Um, who is a former uh, chief operating officer and chief strategy officer at the uh, Babin Yar uh, Holocaust Memorial Center uh, and is now an independent researcher. So I'm passing uh, the word to Barbara Kirsten Blood Gimblet. Um, well, thank you very, very much for this opportunity. Um, I'd like to start by uh, basically setting out a few of, I would say, the challenges and how I see the situation now. And then I'm hoping that um, we, we might be able to discuss as part of our roundtable a way forward. So the first um, is that Babanyar as a site is an extremely complicated and difficult site. It, first of all, it's absolutely vast. It has been so transformed from anything resembling the site where the events happened as to be virtually unrecognizable. And it is littered, I, I, I use that word advisedly, advisedly, with a kind of random ad hoc set of memorials coming from all different directions. So we have to start, we have to start with that. It's a really, really difficult site to work with. And I, I, I do believe that the um, original team had already some very good ideas about how to orient a, a visitor to the site to what it was, what it is, and how it got that way. But that isn't the main, that, and that isn't and shouldn't be the main focus, I think, of our discussion or even of the project itself. So it's a vast site. Then we have to add to that that the, the history of Babanyar in World War II is a very complicated history and it involves different groups, different players, and competing, I would say, not only competing versions of that history, but competing visions of what is to be memorialized, who is to be memorialized, and how it is to be memorialized. So that means that there were, of course, the, the you know, Holocaust is critical, Jewish victims are, are an extremely important part of the site, but it's not the whole, the whole story, nor is this project the whole story. Even though it is focused on the Holocaust, but somehow or other, it seems to take as its mandate the whole story. And I think that a critical uh, discussion has to be um, what exact, where exactly does the Holocaust sit within the wider Babin Yar story? And what is the responsibility of those who are creating the Holocaust, if you will, memorial and museum? What is their responsibility to the wider history of the site? Does it have to do everything? Is it a case of all that happened in Babi Yar, including Jews, or what happened to Jews at Babi Yar, including others? And I think that that um, uh, I think that that issue is really a critical critical issue. And I don't see that anything that I've heard or seen so far actually addresses that issue, but somehow or other seems to dance around it. Now, 
our focus today is the, if you will, Holocaust Memorialization and Museum at the site. And so I want to say a few words um, about that. And um, so one of my questions is, you know, who, who is who is this for? And clearly, um, it's, it's it, you know now that the that this area is right in the middle of of this of this incredible city. Uh, clearly, for the citizens of Kiev, um, it will they I would say would be the first audience for it because they have to live with the site. What does it mean to live with it? Not to come from America and visit it, to come from Israel and visit it. What does it mean to actually have to live with it, particularly in the way, um, if you will, in contrast with how they live with the site today? So I think that, that uh, the issue of who it's for, starting with the citizens of Kiev, starting with all those who have a feel, a personal, uh, if you will, or family or uh, community connection to the site. So who is it for? Who are the various audiences? And how will this project, and I'm speaking now specifically of the Holocaust Memorial and Museum, how will, it, how will it speak to them? How will they find themselves uh, within that story? Um, then the next issue for me is the relationship between memorial and museum. I've always, um, I, I would say that in my own work, looking uh, specifically at Pauline Museum of the History of Polish Jews in Warsaw, but I would also argue for, for a number of other sites, uh, like for example, the Memorial to the Murdered Jews of Europe is another good example, that um, I, I think that when one, if you will, fuses memorial and museum, we lose a lot. We lose a lot that has to do with the very specific nature of memorials and the attitude one brings to them and the nature of them and the role of uh, museums, which I see as institutions of public history. And when public history is instrumentalized or mobilized um, in, in, if you will, in the service of commemoration, then I think we move down a very slippery path. So my first concern would be the relationship between memorialization and historical reckoning, and I see these as complementary, but but not. Uh, but I, I do think that fusing them presents uh, some uh, serious deficits uh, to each of them. So that that would be an issue that I would like to see. Uh, I would like to see addressed. Now, let me turn to what we have so far, because. I mean, this is, I hate to put it this way, this is the gift that keeps on giving. For anybody who wants to think about the issues surrounding a, a memorial site with a difficult history, I, I, this project and its evolution is just, a, if you will, a poster child for good governance and I would say very problematic governance. So clearly I think that one of the discussions we could have is the relationship between the proposal that was put forward and then the transformation, why the transformation, the nature of it, and what was lost and potentially what was gained. I mean, at, at least I, I want to put it out there in that way. So, so first of all, what, you know, and I put this in a way to the panel because there are others that know more about this than I do. What was wrong with what was, what was originally proposed? Why was it abandoned? And what um, what governed, or if you will, what um, what were the factors that led to the appointment of this quote artistic director? Now, the the first so so as I understand it, when when the justification is offered, it the justification is we have to create the biggest, the best, the most innovative, the most spectacular Holocaust memorial ever anywhere in the world. This is not an appropriate starting point. So that that's the first thing. That's not that is not the the appropriate starting point. So th uh, th that's the first thing that I would argue. The second um, is, I would argue is I am not aware of any credible project that appoints someone with absolutely zero 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 experience in dealing with such a complicated project as something called artistic director and then and then places everything under his control i have never heard of such a thing so th this this to my way of thinking is this is very innovative it's completely unprecedented and i also think it's a recipe for disaster 
And so, and, and why? So the, the first thing is that there is, I think, a naivete on the part of the supervisory board as to how museums are created. And there is the naivete that they had a first class historian work with a first class team to create a very good foundation for the historical narrative. And they have some idea that that historical narrative will be respected and will stay intact and that the role of somebody called the artistic director who is now in charge of research and everything else will simply provide a kind of artistic interpretation of that historical narrative as if that historical narrative will survive in that so-called artistic interpretation, which of course is not the case. It can't, it, there, there's no such thing as we have this historical narrative and now we have an artistic interpretation called an exhibition. So that's the first, I would say, misconception or naivete on the part of the supervisory board that has no experience and is actually not in a position to my way of thinking, to evaluate that model of how to create a, a really credible um, um, exhibition and museum. So that would be the that would be the the first thing. The second is that, uh, as I understand it, there's no point in our discussing his initial proposal, because as I understand it, it is not on the table. So you know we could put it aside, but but in fact his films and that proposal were his calling cards. They were the basis. They were what attracted the donors to hire him to take over the whole project. So as uh, you know, I think that um, the, you know, others can speak more clearly as to who saw the proposal, who uh, agreed that he was the right person on the basis of it, even if that proposal would not be the basis for the museum. It was the calling card. A as a calling card, it should have raised every alarm bell in the book because that calling card alone should have disqualified him from this project. In, in, I mean, so, so, and, and we know all of the, we know all of the reasons why. We know all the reasons why. So then, if, if, if it is the case that the supervisory board never saw that proposal, I can't believe that Sharansky never saw the proposal or had no idea on what basis um, Ilya was actually appointed artistic director. But let's say, let's, let's give them the benefit of the doubt and say proposals off the table, they never considered it, it was never taken seriously. Okay, so what do we have now? So I had the opportunity to listen to more than two hours of a um, recorded and then made public a meeting of the supervisory board in which Ilya was uh, basically presented the project. And, and based, there were two takeaways and I'll conclude with this and we can move on to our other panelists. There were two, two, two takeaways from that, from, that, uh, from his, his presentation. So first of all, he had all of his, the people that he's appointed um, and a very, I, I would say, what looked to me to be a young and dedicated and serious and very sincere team of people. I don't want in any way to diminish the, the sincerity and the talent of those that, that are working, uh, that are working with him. So we had each of them present the project that they're responsible for. And there were, if I'm not mistaken, something like 25 different projects and they didn't add up to a whole. They were kind of like a random collection of projects, many of which have zero connection to the creating of a permitted exhibition. So what that, you know, um, uh, why they, how they are prioritizing their energy, their time and their resources now when they need to be preparing to create in very short order, a permanent exhibition for this museum whose shape we have no idea about because I as I understand it, he rejected the architectural project too. So I have no idea is what's the standing of the architectural project. 
So you've got all these random projects, databases and lists of names and information about people and topographical projects. And then this very strange kind of audio sound walk with juxtapositions of what was happening in America at the time that somebody was being killed at Babanyar. So these are kind of like random projects that don't add up to anything. And then Ilya himself uh, made a statement about the exhibition. And the only thing that I heard him say was that he would be commissioning the finest, finest artists in Europe to do projects, to create works for the exhibition. That's it. Well, I don't see a museum. I don't see an exhibition. Um, I don't see anything coherent. And as I understand it, at least from Rabbi Bleich, that given that his original draft of an idea was off the table, that he had until the end of the year to come forward with a coherent proposal for what this museum will be. And uh, so we have another, uh, I would say, three months to see what he will propose. But uh, if he doesn't propose something viable and is extremely difficult for me to see what it might be given everything we have seen so far, this project will be dead in dead in the water. It will it, it simply won't be able to move forward. Not not uh, not given the rejection of the first proposal, the incoherence of the current uh, situation. And what's next? I, I can't see it. And I think that is absolutely tragic because this is an opportunity of a lifetime. And I would be very interested in how the other panelists who are much closer to the project know a lot more about it. I am really looking at it from the outside. I would be very interested in their assessment of where the project stands and should, it, uh, should this uh, current phase not produce an outcome, uh, whether this is the end or whether there is a next chapter. Thank you. Thank you. And I would like to pass the word to Dieter Pohl. Um, Thank you, Julia. Uh, I'm coming from a different angle as a Holocaust historian. Uh, maybe uh, at the beginning, I uh, say some words about my involvement in, in the whole uh, subject and in the project. Um, I wrote a book on the Holocaust in Galicia and uh, did some work on occupation in Ukraine and so on and so forth. And in 2016, I was asked whether I would join uh, the scientific board of the Memorial Center by Jana and somebody else. Um, then I was uh, skeptical about the whole construction, um, Russian Jewish oligarchs paying for the memorial in Ukraine. Uh, at a point where Russia, at least indirectly, leads war against Ukraine. Uh, I was aware of that. But on the other hand, uh, I have to say that the uh, independent Ukraine, which existed um, almost 25 years at that point, or more than 25 years, uh, was not able to put something together. That's why I took the opportunity and joined the scientific board. Uh, I left it in April when the whole uh, um, a so-called concept was coming up in press, and uh, I've seen it, uh, the complete presentation of uh, 2019, which is available on Google Docs, by the way. I don't know whether it's right now, uh, but Dieter, I downloaded uh, it. Uh, I, I'm sorry, Dieter. Uh, um, our attendees uh, write us that there are problems with the sound. With my sound? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, uh, from time to time, have problems with Wi-Fi. So do you hear me? Uh, here, but uh, not not so loud. But so yeah. Okay, I can I can turn it a little bit louder. That's no problem. Uh -huh. but and maybe I, bring the microphone closer to your mouth. Yeah, I have uh, already a headset. Oh, so. good. That's better. <laughs> yeah, because I have children at home, so I need a headset. Uh, okay. So I'm, I'm involved, or I was involved until April, then I left it. Uh, I also have to state that I reviewed the um, competitors project, uh, the competitors concept of the National Academy of 
um, sciences of Ukraine, which is online as far as I know. Um, and it is almost as horrible as, <laughs> as uh, the one which is circulating right now by the Memorial Center. So, but we can address that later on uh, about nationalization. So uh, what is my vision of a, a Bob in the Army Memorial? I think uh, for me as a historian, the biggest problem is uh, we don't know a lot about Barbinia itself. Uh, if you look at Auschwitz with its uh, important memorial, if you look at Warsaw um, with a museum and, and, and the attached uh, infrastructure that's totally different, uh, with Barbinia we uh, know a little bit about the big massacre at the end of September 1941, uh, but even not that. And uh, I think Karel Berkov, probably with Vitali Nachmanovich, are the only two ones uh, who uh, uh, can reconstruct it. But uh, what happened there after September 41 is almost unknown and uh, almost undocumented. And, and that's a big problem if you want to memorialize it. Um, that applies in first place to the victims, who were the victims, how many victims. And um, that's a question I want to uh, specifically address because it's very important for the whole thing. Um, this old Soviet figure of 100,000 victims at Babin Yam. Um, which is more or less prolonged into uh, present time. Uh, and there's no foundation for that. And the big problem with that figure is uh, if you have 100,000 victims and 34,000 Jewish victims, so you assume that the majority of the victims is non-Jewish. And then you have a big problem for, the, uh, for a Holocaust memorial. Actually, uh, uh, according to my research, the number of victims is much lower. It's probably between 50 and 60,000, uh, like in all of the Soviet Union uh, after 45, these high figures uh, were produced and they were cut down by proper research during the 1990s and 2000, but unfortunately not for Kiev. Uh, we don't know about uh, perpetrators very, very closely. So um, it's almost, um, uh, when you read the literature, it's, it's really impossible to say who was the chief of the, the mass killing. Uh, uh, so um, that's all, in, in, it's even worse when you look at uh, uh, what, the, what the surrounding was. Uh, there's a big debate on uh, whether collaborators were present during the big massacre, which collaborators and, and so on and so forth. And uh, we, do, we almost know nothing about the relationship to Stalinism, which is very important for uh, Ukrainian historical memory in general. And you can see it in the uh, acad academy concept uh, where it's uh, heavily uh, included. And we know a little bit on the aftermath. That's, that being said, it's, it's very difficult to set up a memorial on uh, um, uh, a violence uh, which we don't know about very much. And I think uh, research is um, necessary. What concerns my vision of such a memorial or memorial center is it, uh, I think, uh, uh, fourfold. In first place, it's, it's a, of course about memorialization, uh, but what is lacking in both concepts is memorialization according to international standards. I mean, there are rules for that, and this is completely disregarded, uh, uh, especially if you look at the different big centers, Washington, Jerusalem, uh, and, and the, uh, the smaller ones. Um, there is a big problem about uh, the relationship between the different victim groups, the Jews, Soviet POWs, Roma, uh, uh, Kiev citizens, communists, wh uh, whoever. So um, there must be some, some concept how to uh, uh, integrate these, uh, these groups. Um, the second thing is, uh, like Barbara already uh, said, uh, it's a vast area um, and uh, it's, it's all part of Babinia. So we, we don't have one place like the, uh, or a, a delineated place like the Warsaw Ghetto or the Auschwitz camp where this is clear, uh, that's unclear in, in the case um, of Babinia and of course, um, maybe Jana can correct me. Actually, we don't know where the mass graves are properly. So, so I think it's, it's not 100% clear uh, where the mass graves are. Um, I always rely on this aerial photographs of 1943, which show more or less uh, the whereabouts of 
uh, the master. What concerns memorialization uh, today, we tend to individualization very much. So uh, it's necessary to reconstruct uh, victims' lives. Uh, I think that's in a certain sense, uh, the center uh, of mem memorialization. And uh, we are only at the beginning uh, of that. So memorialization is, is the core and most important part of this center. The second thing, however, is documentation or what you call a museum. Uh, in Germany, we, we um, distinguish between documentation centers and museums. Um, uh, for example, uh, three-dimensional ob objects are more in museums and so on and so forth. But I think documentation is very uh, important. And the question is how far should documentation go? And of course, the Barbignan massacres are at the center of documentation, but it's very important to show the context. Given the fact that uh, Ukraine has very few uh, uh, documentations or museums, Tkuma and Dnipro, for example, but for example, there's nothing in Lviv, uh, which would be uh, uh, probably even more important than, than Barbignan because they were uh, much more victims uh, in Lviv, 150,000, and there's almost nothing uh, on that. So I think the Babinia Center has to be um, uh, Ukrainian-wide, and it has to integrate the con uh, context, and that's, of course, the whole prehistory of Nazism, anti-Semitism, the context of war and occupation, and it has to include the context of Holocaust in Europe, especially Eastern uh, Europe, because uh, that's only one part of the whole Holocaust. And probably Babinia is not even the biggest massacre. Uh, we don't know about the Adesa massacre in October 1941, which might have had more victims. And attached to documentation, you need an archive, you need a little research department, and all of this has to be done according to international standards. The third purpose for me is education. That's very important to lead the school classes uh, to this place in order uh, um, to uh, um, realize uh, uh, what, what that history actually meant. I mean, if you look into Ukrainian school books, uh, there's one line or let's say uh, one paragraph about Babinia which says almost nothing. So this is uh, only at the beginning for, you need an infrastructure uh, for education, need a library, you need lots of digital media, and so on. And the fourth uh, purpose in my mind is uh, a Barbinia Center as a public place, uh, in first place for civil society, but also for the arts and the media for public discussion uh, of not only uh, the wartime period, but of, of, of current problems uh, of human rights and so on and so forth. Um, so that's important. And finally, a word um, on uh, my vision of, of money, uh, the funding such a center. I think the Ukrainian state should pay uh, for, for such a, a memorial and um, uh, in combination with, with Germany, because Germany is uh, the successor state of the German Reich and Germany already um, installed several memorials in Ukraine, about 20 as far as I know, funded by the German Foreign Office, and Germany uh, should cooperate in this uh, and fund uh, part of this. So this is more or less uh, what I think uh, is necessary. I don't want to comment right now on the uh, current situation about that. Thank you. Thank you. And I pass the word to Jana Barinova. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, so I was working for the Babin Yar Holocaust Memorial Center from 2015 till the end of 2019. And uh, I do believe that promoting tolerance and building more cohesive communities is the truly one of the greatest challenges of the 21st century and uh, it might seem to believe that the Babinyar project has the potential to do just that by significantly changing the way that people understand the true extent uh, of the Holocaust around the world. And uh, the accumulated global experience uh, in remembering the great catastrophes of the 20th uh, century is rich and diverse. 
And uh, that is why uh, the Babin Yar Holocaust Memorial Center was looking uh, to cooperate with both Ukrainian researchers and foreign academics with a rich experience in similar projects around the world. Uh, probably I would like to add a few words about my personal motivation, how I have decided to took this challenge and why I left this project as well. So uh, I was born in uh, 1989 as the Berlin Wall was falling and the Soviet Union started to collapse a new independent state of Ukraine was established and uh, in 1991 but without its own identity. And today I'm Ukrainian global citizen and promoter of uh, the tolerance and human rights. And this project was a journey, but not only for me, but for everyone in Ukraine who belongs to the post-Soviet generation. Personally, I grew up as the rubble from the Soviet empire was being cleared uh, to make way for a new democratic future. Also, I have Jewish roots and I'm now exploring my Jewish identity as well. And uh, um, thanks to my uh, work at the Babanyar Holocaust Memorial Project, uh, I, I had a chance to explore it more in details. And um, I uh, always felt that I belonged to two separate worlds, the emerging Ukrainian nation and uh, my culturally Jewish upbringing with traces of the old Soviet Union. Uh, I'm very comfortable with both this part of my identity, but I'm still struggling with lack of understanding. So the Bab and Yar commemoration, it is also about the evolving identity of contemporary Ukrainians and anyone in Ukraine who cares about reforms, about our common democratic future cannot be indifferent to this project. The problem of the Babin Yar that everyone was seeking for their own historical justice, but not a common vision of justice. And um, the topography of the Babin Yar today, it is a topography of search for modern Ukrainian identity. I do realize how hard it is to talk uh, about new perspective of remembering uh, Bab and Yar after so many years in country where um, the politics of memory is so inconsistent, but um, I'm confident that today it's a vital matter uh, for Ukrainian society. And uh, I have a profound conviction that is only a reboot of Bab and Yar memory will enable Ukraine to formulate very important questions. Uh, for the country. And the questions relate not only to the historical memory, but also how we built our future in Ukraine. Uh, so we, I mean my team and I, uh, we wanted to create a unique memorial which will reflect all the facets of this tragedy, uh, tragedies of the Holocaust and of the Second World War, as well as the post-war achievements of people um, uh, that were ready to risk their own freedom for the sake of asserting fundamental human rights. So the creation of a such project, the creation of the Bab and Yar Holocaust Memorial Center is a part of a wider and extraordinary process. And such regenerative process require a leap of imagination uh, to gain something positive from the negative story. And um, uh, from my perspective, uh, this project aims to be a place for the past and the future to encounter each other and learn the lessons necessary for humanity to prevail. So we started uh, from, from the discussion, from a dialogue, from a round tables, uh, from debates, uh, from expert meetings and Dieter Paul uh, took several times part of these round tables. Uh, we flew several times uh, to meet Barbara in person. So our first round table discussions were for our big institutional planning questions. And our hope was to leverage 
expertise, knowledge, and success to point us uh, in the right direction as we were focused um, our mission and we began our full uh, conceptual and architectural design of the center. We try to capture best practices and lesson learns uh, so we could maximize our efforts uh, and impact on the communities that we served. And uh, I also want to recognize that what work in one country uh, or in one context may not work in another. And uh, so there were times of disagreement, but ultimately the responsibility uh, rested on our shoulders to determine uh, what is the right path uh, toward uh, for all our stakeholders. So uh, we try to understand how we can combine um, approaches to the past frame in terms of historical memory uh, together with those applied by academic historiography. Um, and uh, obviously it produces many contradictions. Uh, of course, it's very difficult to write the Holocaust narrative in Eastern Europe especially in Ukraine, where borders has changed several times, uh, such that it is unclear what territory should be described within the narrative. What, what do we mean when we say Ukraine? Uh, this is why the narrative also cover from Polish, Hungarian, uh, Romanian, and other territories, Belarusian. And uh, also we faced fears that interest in the Holocaust is uh, driven by a grotesque competition uh, of victims and that focus on the Jews might obscure the other victims of the Babin Yard tragedy. Uh, so uh, I hope that uh, in the end of the day, uh, the tragedy of the Babin Yard will occupy a worthy place in uh, all Ukrainian collective memory space. Obviously, Ukraine has a lot to do. For example, Ukraine uh, still is not a member of, of IRA. And I do believe that if Ukraine would become uh, IRA member, uh, some internal conflicts would be uh, solved in another way because there are international standards and some things a priori couldn't appear in Ukraine uh, because uh, Ukraine would be stick to international compliance regarding all Holocaust commemoration activities. And uh, I do believe that Ukraine can develop a language in which uh, Ukraine will be able to talk about the tragedy of the Holocaust on its territory in all its complexity and uh, I would love to see Ukraine that can formulate very clear message to the future that Ukraine will never support a regime ready to disregard the value of uh, human life and human dignity for the sake of triumph of any political ideology. So uh, the uh, realization of the Babin Yard Memorial is crucial it's a vital matter for Ukrainian society. Um, there are many stakeholders, even too many stakeholders. And I think that uh, Ukrainian state has to be more proactive. Uh, I think that Ukraine must become uh, I remember in the nearest future. I think that um, position kind of special envoy on the Holocaust matter in Ukraine also should appear. And this will help to stabilize the current situation. Mm, I'm ready to answer any additional question later, but this is my intro speech. Thank you. Thank you. And we can open the floor to questions, uh, which... Uh, we already have two enough. So many. Now we have uh, another question about uh, about a commentary. Uh, sorry for uh, the interruption. Uh, <laughs> 
I'm Oksana Davlopolova. I'm a member of the Program Committee of Pesa Commerce Conference, and uh, uh, I'm present here as a representative of, uh, of, of Pesa Commerce team. Uh, uh, so we have um, a, a remark uh, about Holocaust uh, in Lviv. Uh, Dieter mentioned uh, that the problem of uh, memorialization of Holocaust and Lviv. And uh, we have a remark from Daria Badur um, about uh, the memorial space, the space of synagogues, a project of Center for, for Urban History. And it's uh, really very important and very interesting. And uh, it's very important uh, as for me because it's a, a result of common efforts of uh, municipal um, powers in Lviv, of uh, international uh, organizations and the uh, uh, Center for Urban History. Uh, as for me, it's uh, really a very uh, inspiring um, example of uh, memorialization of Holocaust in Ukraine. And uh, we have we have a great hope if we have uh, such uh, such spaces. It's a remark. It's not a it's not a question. Maybe uh, we can launch uh, the second round of uh, questions from uh, from Yulia maybe to our participants. Sorry for interruption. Uh I think uh, I'm, I'm very grateful to our participants for presenting such uh, three such different uh, approaches to uh, conceptualizing the Holocaust, uh, the memory of Babanyar massacre. Uh, and uh, I also think that uh, there were Quite a few uh, very good questions uh, posed during the presentations, and uh, uh, it would be I think it would be great to uh, focus on them because uh, in many ways these are the questions that uh, are uh, that uh, a lot of people who uh, uh, got engaged with the, this project uh, somehow who care about this project in many ways are asking themselves uh, and. Uh, I had a general question, uh, which I uh, like, th that's a question from me. Uh, but um, when I am uh, reading uh, the materials posted on Facebook by uh, the Memorial Center, when I'm reading their program, um, there, is a, there is an interesting message that I sense, I might be wrong, but uh, I sense this kind of message that there is a certain guilt put on uh, people, I don't know, all Ukrainians or people living in Kiev who are not properly remembering. And uh, engagement in remembrance becomes this kind of debt that we have to pay. Uh, for me that in terms of memory theory and commemorialization, commemoration that rise, raises the question of how we should approach this uh, I guess for museum it would be in a way community building but still uh, what uh, how do we approach the, this uh, tragic memories in a society that has gone through several generations when the memory was really not preserved like we, we, we don't even know where the grades are um, and uh, and then we can uh, go on uh, with some of the wonderful questions that uh, Barbara asked. Uh, one of them is for whom, uh, for example, uh, who, uh, how how is the memorial, or how should the memorial be interacting with uh, people who live around the site who, for people who live in this city, uh, for people who live in this country too, because as Dieter mentioned, uh, and as Jana mentioned, it's, it's, it's something that should not be just localized or uh, 
you know, reduced to one event. We, we had many more events that have not been yet properly covered, neither uh, through uh, commemoration sites nor through research, as far as I understand. Okay, uh, I'll open the floor uh, to our speakers. <laughs> First. I was very, I was very intrigued by Dieter's uh, comments um, of the approach in Germany, where there's a distinction between the document documentation center and museum. And um, I was thinking, for example, of the murder Jews, the memorial to the murder Jews of Europe, which is a kind of prime example of what he has. Uh, what he has described. Uh, I just want to say a couple of words about it because I think it's relevant to our thinking about pr what might be created at uh, Babanyar. And that is that there, there is a very clear case of the separation between a memorial that's very abstract, in my opinion also very powerful, although also controversial, and something called information center. You know, that, th that kind of language, I can't imagine it elsewhere, to be honest with you. I think it's very, very German because it's not even documentation center. It, you know, if you say information center, or maybe it is in German, but if you say information center, it sounds like you go there to pick up a map of Berlin, you know, or tickets for the, for the, uh, for the metro. So, but, but I think the intention, the intention is to reduce the expectation that there'll be anything spectacular there and to um, also do in the informa so-called information center what the memorial doesn't do, won't do, shouldn't do. And what is very extraordinary, and, and I'm not, th this is by no means a, a proposal for what should happen at Babanyar, not at all. But, but I, my, I wanna make a very strong point here. So, but people tell me that they were more moved by the so-called information center than they were by the memorial. And the information center is exemplary in presenting, if you will, the history of the Holocaust in the most minimalist, most documentary, most unspectacular and most emotionally moving way. And, the, and, and this strikes me, um, and for me, the issue is not whether it's a museum with objects or a documentation center with documents, that's not the issue. The issue is sensibility. And there, there is something very specific in the way in which, let's say, the new uh, exhibition of Buchenwald or the, the, the memorial to the murder Jews of, uh, of Europe. There are other, other examples or the crimes of the Wehrmacht. Something very specific, and that is to avoid anything spectacular, to be as restrained and as factual and as precise as possible. And the assumption is that visitors bring so much emotion already to the situation that the last thing they need is something that will pump up an emotional response, that there is a great antipathy to emotional manipulation, to drama, to spectacle. So the, the contrast between what I think of generally, I mean, maybe there are exceptions and Dieter's in a better position to talk about this than I, in a kind of national, um, I would call it a structure of feeling or a sensibility or way of approaching a, a deep, deep, deep trauma. And in the case of Germany, it has, it has very much to do with complicity. And Daria Stola made a very important statement that I think could guide our thinking about Babinyar. He said that we today, those of us born after the war, raised after the war, are not responsible for what our ancestors did, but we are responsible for what we do with that knowledge. That's our responsibility. So those two, those are the two points that might you know, be useful for our discussion. One, national differences in the, if you will, emotional register or structure of feeling around these difficult topics and ways in which they are approached in call it museums, call it documentation centers. And the other is the, our responsibility in what we do with the knowledge that we have about what others did without being personally responsible for those actions. So those would be two things I'd put out for perhaps for discussion. 
Um, let me first try to answer uh, the first questions by Yulia, and that's um, the specific situation in post-Soviet uh, countries that the memory is cut off in a certain sense. I don't think you have this in other communist states. For example, in Hungary and Poland, you have a certain continuity. You have Jewish institutions who, who uh, were serving for that. Um, and the official policy was a little bit different. In the Soviet Union, we have a complete uh, silence on the Holocaust, more, more or less. Uh, not on the other victim groups. Um, that's not 100% clear. You know this uh, peaceful Soviet citizens uh, term uh, which we actually don't know why it was applied, um, but you find it on every memorial. Uh, one thing which is interesting is that the POWs were me mentioned separately. Uh, that's very astounding uh, because, you know, the POW question is very embarrassing for the Soviet uh, regime, uh, but nevertheless, uh, they, they used it. But there's new research on, on this memorialization. So I think uh, uh, one thing is, of course, to... Uh, let's say, um, reactualize this memory for new generations because the wartime generation is, is dying out more or less. But the second thing is, and I think in the um, historical uh, narrative, uh, which was compiled by the team, this is, um, I think, very well done, is to show how this memory uh, was more or less uh, silenced after 45. So that there is something lost, that there has been something lost during uh, the years, especially, let's say, this starts 47 uh, till the late 80s, when it, under Gorbachev it started to, to uh, resurface in a, in a certain sense. That's also a big problem for us historians, because there are no interviews in that period. So most of the interviews of that time are, were made in Israel uh, by emigre uh, people. So I think that's that's one uh, point, uh, uh, one way to, to address this subject. The second thing I um, think is the localization. Um, for Kiev people, it's the Kiev place of mass murder, and not only the Jews, as we know, but the other end. But I think the, the museum has to give some guideline, uh, get some guidance to find your, let's say, mass graves in Rivne, uh, uh, anywhere, because uh, until now the situation is rather bad in Ukraine. Uh, you have lots of memorials, but sometimes they are located in forests and run down or in Jewish cemeteries. Uh, you will never find them. For example, in Ivano Frankivsk, I asked taxi drivers, uh, tell me where, where to go to the mass execution place. Now it's a little memorial. Uh, it's, it's better now. Uh, but um, relating to this comment on Lviv, that's very nice what the Center for Urban Studies did, but uh, that's typical, I would say. The Center for Urban Studies is funded by a, a Swiss uh, a guy. Um, it's it's totally a, a foreign concept, more or less, due to uh, historical culture here. And if you go to the Golden Rose the Synagogue, uh, that's not a documentation center. This is, uh, uh, I mean, this is a place to sit and, and, and read these five uh, tables or uh, tablets, uh, which are there. So I think it's necessary to show all uh, visitors and all visitors from Ukraine where their place of mass murder was, the place located nearby. And if you look into the encyclopedia which exists by Alexander Kruglov, um, you have around 2,000 mass executions of Jews on the territory of Ukraine. So probably you will find every 10 kilometer one. Um, and we have to locate them. And you know this Paris initiative by uh, Père de Bois, Yahad in Unum, uh, they start to geotag them. So you will find them in the forest uh, if, you, if you look for. That's, I think, for all the visitors from uh, uh, Ukrainian visitors from outside uh, Kiev, that's very important. And, and this is in the digital world, of course. This will go through the internet uh, because I don't have, uh, I've not big hopes. Uh, that there will be a big memorial in every place where a big massacre was. What concerns um, the visitors, um, I think it is most important to have uh, uh, young people there in, in first place. In general, if you look at Babi Yar right now, I would say 80% of the visitors are foreigners. If I go there, people from Israel go there, people from the States go there. 
but I would say an average Kiev guy won't go there unless uh, he has a visitor uh, to show him. That's, by the way, the same, uh, I lived long, uh, long in Munich. Uh, most of the museums in Munich I saw when I had visitors uh, and, and they wanted to see the museum, so, so I went with them. Um, so I think there must be um, some kind of um, a structure to draw, to draw them uh, in. And of course it's education in first place, but it can also be cultural institution and so on and so forth. Uh, that's uh, um, uh, the addressees in first place. Uh, what what uh, Barbara said, um, I think, uh, of course, that's a typical German way and, and the tendency of the last 20 years is to go away from the museum in the direction of the documentation. It has to do with the three-dimensional objects, but it also has to do with a big uh, um, discussion of the museum people what is appropriate for uh, memorializing not Nazi crimes and communist crimes uh, in a certain sense too. Uh, this is also uh, related. Um, but I think, uh, especially in the case of Babinia, where you have this big territory, uh, which is very well suited for having different installations made, uh, however, uh, whatever kind of installations relating to specific groups, like it's right now and not very well done, um, or to specific events, or to specific persons and so on. Um, this is a good way to memorialize and probably in the center, uh, there should be uh, this individualization. Uh, but I think um, this is in a certain sense, um, uh, um, the, the important thing I always say about Holocaust uh, research and memorialization is you have to go to the individual, but you cannot do it without knowing the complete context and the complete context is European wide because otherwise we end up and say, oh, this is a personal tragedy, uh, but you don't know it's related to something much bigger and this happened all over Europe uh, in, a, in a certain sense. So the Holocaust is a big structure uh, and without this big structure, you cannot uh, understand the individual uh, fate. So I'm still in favor of this uh, German approach um, to explain a little bit more. Of course, you cannot do it like uh, it's done, for example, in this uh, place of information uh, in Berlin. Now it's uh, probably 50% audiovisual, digital, uh, whatever. But I think, um, the Barbian has a specific structure. It has no building like Auschwitz also, uh, where this falls together. So the place of memorialization and the place of documentation, um, it, has a, it has a different structure and you have to go there uh, in, in, inside the territory and you have to see uh, the place of information. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple of more questions. I, I will read them then. Um, so, uh, question, how is Babin Yar presented, if at all, in Ukrainian media, films, documentaries? How does the relative denial fit in with the big nationalist trend, as, for example, Khmelnytsky presented as a big national hero with the pogroms he organized totally erased? Can a memorial to Babin Yar even exist if history has been rewritten in a, in a nationalist way? Is even an objective true memorial museum invisible in this context? <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, if I may on uh, uh, again, um, I would uh, completely uh, uh, stay away from Khmelnytsky. Um, because you end up in this continuity of alleged Ukrainian anti-Semitism. Um, it's the Khmelnytsky uprising is one of the worst massacres in Jewish history, no doubt about that. Uh, I think the latest figure out 20,000 or so, which was half of the Jewish community. Um, but um, I, I'm not sure whether you can blame Khmelnytsky for that. Uh, he was uh, the leader of the peasant uprising. You know, we had this discussion about Pitluda in 1919, 1920, 
Um, he, he was also not responsible for the pogroms. He was not a pogromist, like it's often seen, and you know he was killed uh, by a Jew uh, for allegedly being a pogromist. Uh, but uh, Petlura didn't do anything against the pogroms, actually. I mean, he issued an order, but very late and, and very soft and so on. So um, it's really about 1941, uh, what uh, we should do. Um, what concerns the nationalist trend uh, of the uh, uh, last years, which I think, um, um, I mean, you, you shouldn't exaggerate it. The one thing is uh, there is on uh, Russian propaganda, uh, which uh, highlights Ukrainian fascism and so on and so forth. Um, that's of course ridiculous. Uh, I mean, if you see actually uh, where Svoboda uh, was active and, and, and how much uh, uh, they got in the election, uh, that's not important. If you go to Ternopil or so, or to Drohobich, you, you, uh, you will have uh, that problem. Something else is the history politics of the last five years uh, uh, by Mr. Vyatrovich. Uh, that was highly nationalizing and it was a, a yeah, almost falsification of history, uh, what he was doing uh, there. Um, and the interesting thing, however, is if you looked at the homepage of the Institute of National Memory, there was all, always something about Babinyar. So Babinyar was in, in a certain sense the cover up for his main purpose. So I'm writing uh, cooking recipes of the UPA, uh, that's important. And then I have something on Babinyar because I also remember the other victims. That was just a, a pretext that was a, a, a PR strategy uh, and nothing else. He was not, uh, interest in that. I think um, the responsible institutions in Ukraine uh, until recently, at least until Vyatrovich was fired, had not good advice uh, in, in historical matters. And they are probably not very well advised to support uh, the Memorial Center right now. Um, this is I don't, I don't think Zelensky is very much interested in, in, in all of these matters. Um, it's just about uh, uh, politics. So I wouldn't exaggerate this trend of nationalization. Uh, unfortunately, it's very strong among, among the historians. There are liberal historians like Georgi Kasyanov and Ihir Ilyushin, um, who uh, in, in, in the, <laughs> let's say, in the periphery, you find a lot of them. Uh, at uh, uh, um, the beef and, and so on and so forth. But it, it's still plural. I always compare it with Hungary, for example, where you have an ex uh, extremely strong nationalist history politics, where the, the government is trying to push um, a national history narrative in an unbelievable way. Uh, um, that's completely different. So I would say history is not as important in, in Ukraine. And, and that's why the precondition uh, for a good Babinyar memorial are not that bad. It's more a question, um, uh, do you want to have it uh, according to which standards, uh, uh, who does it and where's the money from? Uh, because it's highly necessary. I mean, next year we will have 80 years off and there's nothing appropriate uh, there. Uh, that's quite clear. But I also want, want to reiterate, it's not just about Kiev. The, the majority of the Kiev Jews were able to evacuate in 1941. In Western Ukraine, they were not. That's where the Jews were killed. And uh, we know that approximately 1.5 million Jews were killed in present day Ukraine's border, including Crimea. Uh, and more than half of them were killed in on Polish territory. Because for me, Western Ukraine was until 1944 Poland, because the annexation by Stalin was illegal, according to international law. And only in 1944, the communist government of Poland accepted uh, um, the new borders. That's, that's quite clear. Uh, and, and that's why we have this strange uh, uh, counting problem that the Poles say they have 3 million uh, Holocaust victims and the Ukrainians say they have 1.5 million and there's an overlap of 800,000 <laughs> because they uh, were on the Polish uh, side. So this all always has to be taken into consideration 
uh, not to be focused only on Kiev and only on Babinia. I would be quite happy to have a, a kind of, a, let's say, a decentralized structure, uh, which has uh, branches, for example, in, in all the places, uh, Lviv, Rivne is, is big thing, Adyessa is very important and so on, where the, where the Holocaust took place. And I again say probably more Jews were killed in Adyessa, by the way, by the Romanians and not by the Germans uh, than in Kiev. Thank you. Uh, so, Uh, Maybe I think just one, one remark only. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. What we need is a completely new concept. Mm. Because if you look into the, the concept of the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences, which I said is online in Ukrainian and English, and that's a kind of national shrine for the Ukraine with 5% of Holocaust in it. And the concept I said is outrageously bad and unprofessional. I uh, actually have to say that. I would even say this is worse <laughs> than the concept of uh, uh, the historical, uh, uh, the Holocaust Memorial Center, because the Holocaust Memorial Center exists uh, of two concepts. One is a historical narrative, which is not a museum concept, of course, and a complete unclear so-called artistical uh, idea, I would call it. And I suppose we won't see it at the end of the year. Uh, this is going on for, for a long time un, until we have it. What we need is something new in between. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the question that I guess develops on the previous one, um, one of the conference participants said that under the current circumstances, the Babinyar memory in today's Ukraine became toxic. Would roundtable participants agree? It might be the reiteration of what you already said, though. But maybe somebody wants to add. Because, yeah. No, it's the memory is not toxic. We have a complicated situation right now but we also have a slowly developing, I would say, political culture of a nation. And um, actually, I, what, what happened in the Ukraine the last 20 years is nation building. I mean, that's quite clear. And as we know, as historian, nation building is, in a certain sense, a precondition of democracy. I mean, it also leads to nationalism and has very bad consequences like wars and, and mass killing. But nation building is an important structure to put together a nation of citizens being aware of the common cause and so on and so forth. And so, so um, if you compare it to the German case, the Germans were in a, the West Germans were in a much better position uh, in 1945. The Western allies gave them everything uh, to put together democracy and it took more or less, I mean, I'm exaggerating now, uh, 35 years until they remembered the Holocaust properly. That was in 1980 that it started. So if we look at the Ukraine right now, we still have another, uh, let's say, five or six years <laughs> to develop, though under completely different conditions. It means there's no, uh, it's not as wealthy. It is in a very difficult international situation. And uh, Germany had lots of uh, democratic traditions in 1945. It had a democracy uh, before Nazism and so on. So uh, actually, as an historian, I see this slowly developing. And that's why um, I'm also, uh, actually, I'm a, I'm a Western historian, but I say the Ukrainians have to do it themselves. Uh, that means they have to develop this as part of their memory, as victimizing as it is, and that's the concept of the uh, academy. We are the victims and we are citizens of Ukraine, but also implicating um, not the own citizens because the Ukraine didn't exist in 1940, implicating the own society in that case. And that means there was 
denunciation, there was robbery, there was auxiliary police, and so on and so forth. This is at a much lower level at the Germans' uh, responsibility, but this is part of the memory. And if you want to have a democratic memory, you have to see the whole st structure, and this has to be a generally critical memory. It means a, a memory which is able to accept uh, what has been documented and what, what can be shown. Um, uh, but what concerns collaboration, I'm not very uh, sympathetic to this term, by the way, but this is another uh, discussion. Uh, it's less than in the Baltics, for example. Uh, in, in the Baltics, um, uh, 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 the Jews were by, uh, in part murdered by uh, Lithuanians, Latvians, and Estonians. Uh, without German uh, uh, Germans directly participating to a certain extent. So um, you have to face it like the French did it, like uh, the Dutch did it. They had big discussions, uh, but under a very favorable uh, uh, circumstances, um, 50 years, 60 years after the war. Thank you. Um... I, uh, um, okay, so uh, I think that the main problem that uh, Ukrainian government, uh, Ukrainian state doesn't act as the stakeholder, actually. It doesn't have proactive position in the Holocaust memorialization. Uh, particularly uh, in Babin Yar memorialization. Uh, so today we have two projects, uh, Babin Yar Holocaust Memorial Center, the private one that recently became quite toxic. Uh, we see it because there are more than five open letters from different groups of Ukrainian and international community. Uh, we can't interpret it as the good sign uh, for the project. So let's be honest. Uh, it's a certain Likmut test that uh, something goes wrong. Maybe temporarily, we don't know, we will see. And we have uh, another project that personally I don't call a project because we have uh, a document. It's concept, it's narrative developed by Ukrainian historians, but it is not a project. When we say project, uh, what do we mean? We mean, uh, I don't know, team, group of people that come to work, um, PR managers, fundraisers, curators, uh, uh, such projects requires enormous undertaking. It's enormous effort. So, but today we have uh, just paper elaborated by a group of scientists. We can discuss it, but when anyway, it, it is not a project. So it is a document that hasn't been institutionalized yet. So we can't compare Ukrainian project and private project because Ukrainian, it is not a project. It is a document that has to be uh, developed. It has to be framed. Uh, who uh, comes to work every day? Who is responsible for this project? Every day from nine to six, I don't know. So there is no such person, there is no such team. Uh, in the contrast, a private project uh, organized in uh, quite a good way in terms of project management. So, uh, and it is a problem of Ukrainian state. It, it, it doesn't have proactive position. We don't have uh, legislation. We don't have special law. Ukraine is not a IRA member. We don't have special envoy on these issues. Um, so for me, this is the one of the main problem. Then I agree with Dieter Paul that we don't have a regional network. It's, it is very centralized, right? There are several cities that uh, trying to find their own way uh, on the Holocaust memorialization, but still Kyiv is the capital. Um, so uh, answering the question about, uh, about 
toxic project, uh, uh, etc. Uh, then I'm reading the question, uh, it would be very interested to hear from the Ukrainian participants, uh, what should be the main principle behind the new Babin Yar Memorial, maybe like top three principles. Uh, I think for any project, it is tr transparency, it's uh, good governance, um, good governments, uh, I mean, supervisory board or board of trustees, uh, well thought, well balanced, composed of diverse groups, Ukrainian and international uh, one, opinion leaders, probably former politicians, intellectuals, uh, historians, and um, very clear uh, governance architecture. Uh, so, uh, supervisory board, management board, scientific board, responsibility of e each body, how do they communicate, what is the workflow. Um, so, um, first it is uh, governance, uh, transparency, uh, participation of the state of Ukraine, uh, it's also extremely important. Uh, yeah, and it's experts and compliance with international standards, dozens of them, uh, like Charter of uh, International uh, Memorials, uh, Charter of uh, International Museums, uh, IRA documents, uh, lots of European uh, Union documents. So um, Holocaust project in Ukraine must stick to this, uh, to this rule, to the standards, to these charters. Uh, and I think this is the, the right path towards the successful uh, Bab and Yar, and not only Bab and Yar. Ukraine has thousands of Yars uh, all over Ukraine. Um, so. Thank you. Uh, I would add a small remark here because apparently there are uh, the the state project is contracting an exhibition design company right now, and the plans are to do something uh, by like in a year, apparently. So I, I don't know what it will result in, but uh, at least there are this negotiation. Th there is a contract, actually. But who? Who, who is contracting? It's the uh, uh, Institute of National Memory. It is the Ministry of Culture. Uh, who who is contracting? Who is responsible for this tender? Who is commissioning? Uh, well, I cannot answer this question because <laughs> I communicated with contractor, not the. <laughs> I'm tracing quite carefully what's going on, and I'm just finding post news about tender that already closed or memorandum that was already signed uh, without public hearings, without public discussions, without listening sessions with the citizen. I think that state project makes the same mistakes as the private project. It's an illusion that they are kind of different ways. I'm, not, I'm really not uh, arguing that. Um, <laughs> uh, so we have one more question. Um, if I may ask, what yep. precisely is going to be complete in one year? Uh, the state uh, commemoration center. I don't. Uh, exa I, I think Yana can uh, say how exactly it's called, but uh, that's crazy. I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's not possible. It's just not possible. It's a fantasy. Uh, I, I can only state attest to the fact that there is a contract. <laughs> um, okay. The proof, will, as we say in English, the proof will be in the pudding. Yes. One year from now, we can convene again, and we will see. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, we have uh, a question uh, about uh, uh, Vitaly Nachmanovich uh, uh, concept. Uh, what are the problematic points there, in your opinion? That's. I guess for Dieter. Yeah, sorry, sorry, I uh, enter once more here, but probably I'm uh, the one. Um, um, Inari Boryak asked me in January to review it. Uh, and by the way, they promised to put it online, my review, which is 14 pages long. And the whole concept is extremely amateurish, I have to say. It consists of two museums. One is a Holocaust museum, and they have no idea what a Holocaust museum looks like, neither 
by the museum structure nor by the content with the holocaust is there are totally wrong information about the holocaust the second one is uh, even more problematic is the babinyam museum and the babinyam museum is about the place and it uh, um, as far as the concept goes it goes back to uh, what babinyam was let's say in the 19th century so what it meant for bourgeois kiev and so on and so forth and it ends in 1961 with the Kurenivka mudslide. And um, as far as uh, you see it in the concept, it's more or less you have uh, the Jewish victims of mass murders and those who were uh, drowned in 1961 by this mudslide, uh, uh, more or less uh, in the same room. Uh, and the whole context was to memorialize them as Ukrainian citizens. So it's a kind of retrospective uh, making people into Ukrainian citizens. Um, and uh, the Jews are among them, for example, the Russians are not very important there and it's highly politicized. It's also makes reference to the ongoing war. And uh, unfortunately I have to say there are, uh, there is a racist remark in the, in the, uh, concept. It's, uh, it's Ukraine is, uh, uh, let's say, uh, an important uh, fortress against Asianism. It's actually included in this concept. Uh, uh, I don't have any problems with Asians, maybe Vitaly has, but uh, uh, I wrote that down. And uh, my conclusion to that was it's not only unprofessional, but it's also a prolongation of the Soviet style memorialization. The Soviets did in their inscriptions a peaceful Soviet citizens. And what the academy wants to do is peaceful Ukrainian citizens, more or less, to replace that bind. It, it has to be completely reworked if, if this uh, 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 should be a concept for internationally uh, recognized uh, museums concept. Uh, actually, um, uh, I was really astounded that they even put it online, but you can read it there. Thank you. Um, we have, um, what do you think? Uh, so, well, we ha we'll have to be very fast on that uh, because we have four minutes left. Uh, what do you think on the environmental history of mass graves on approaches that combines uh, humanities and soil sciences while thinking about post-genocidal spaces. What do you think on approaches beyond anthropocentrism in Holocaust studies? Sorry, uh, it's me again. Uh, but I think that's a, a new trend in Holocaust history is, is forensic historiography to uh, locate mass graves and to analyze them. Uh, if you find a rabbi, you can even open them, uh, a rabbi who's uh, allowing that, which is uh, according to halachic law, of course, not allowed. Um, I think that's an uh, important addition. Uh, but I think the main uh, the core of Holocaust research should relate to uh, do documents, to uh, witness statements, to autobiographic uh, documents to reconstruct what actually happened. So it's actually an addition which might be useful in some places. For example, if you do micro studies, then this is uh, important. And of course, it's for memorialization, it's very important because uh, there's new um, techniques to identify mass graves. I once met uh, Carolyn Sturz uh, from England, who is the foremost expert on that. She does research, for example, on Srebrenica massacre and so on and so forth. And she knows how you find a mass grave uh, after 70 years without uh, interfering into the uh, uh, corpses. Um, and that's, of course, very important. And as I said before, uh, uh, it is essential for Babinya memorialization to find out where the mass graves are. It's essential for documentation. It's essential out of religious reason. And it's essential for memorialization. And this. Uh, uh, addresses not only the, the, uh, the mass graves of Jews, but also the other victim groups. 
We have to know where they are because they have to have proper graves as far as that is still possible. Of course, uh, the, the corpses have been burned in, in 43, uh, or at least most of them. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we have one minute left. I would like to thank our presenters. First of all, uh, this has been very uh, helpful and uh, really, I think, quite profound discussion that uh, has uh, uh, posed questions that uh, I hope uh, those who are listening to us can think of as, uh, as well. I would like to thank everybody who was asking questions. I apologize for not uh, reading your names. Uh, first time uh, with the digital conferences. Um, and I hope that this discussion will continue, of course, uh, that we will uh, still uh, n n be engaged with this project and hopefully we will see uh, some better developments than the ones that we've seen uh, so far, unfortunately. Uh, would anybody like to add something? Uh, okay, uh, well then, uh, thank you so much again. And uh, I guess we can say this session is over. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.